uh, starting today, we're going to be going over a series over the, the Psalms. Uh, and it's something that we have not done before, and I really haven't found a whole lot of churches that have done that. But what we're going to be doing is, is looking through different Psalms out of, the, out of the whole book of Psalms and exploring what uh, God is trying to speak to us um, out of these different chapters. Just to give you a brief introduction of what the Psalms are, it is, as, as what many would say, is the hymn book of the Bible. Um, I love the Psalms just because it, it takes uh, the very presence of God and all of His holiness and His glory and somehow can connect to our humanity. Um, you could read through a, just a chapter out of the Psalms and you'll, you'll see just these emotional expressions of, of various people and the struggles that they're going through or perhaps even the joys and the celebration that they're going through. And somehow it ties in to the glory and to the presence of God. And so this morning, we're going to be diving into Psalm 28. So if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and open it up to Psalm 28. And before we even begin reading the psalm, I just want you to know why I selected this psalm out of the Bible, um, Psalm 28. Uh, my family and I have been going through a lot of hardships over the past month or so. Um, my 95-year-old grandfather has been in and out of the hospital his, his health is just slowly declining. Um, along with that, Elsa's cousin was involved in a very bad car accident uh, when he and a group of guys were going up to Oklahoma to do a mission trip. Uh, you might have heard about it. One of the uh, passengers actually died. His name is Patrick. Um, to couple, to, in addition to that, recently we found out that one of the members of our family has been diagnosed with cancer. Um, and obviously we just heard about Sylvia. All of these things bringing... Uh, just a, a great sense of heaviness and sorrow in our lives. And it was during a time of family prayer that we were just opening, reading through the Psalms, and Psalm 28 was one of the Psalms that we had been reading. And really, it just stuck out to me, and it's essentially why I'm going to be talking about it today. It's been a challenge for me. Uh, I just want to highlight one verse that really, really gripped me. Um, in a moment where we're desperate, when we don't have an answer, much less we don't have any idea as to how to respond to the tragedy, to the struggle that we're facing in our lives. I love verse 8. In that very first line, it says, The Lord is the strength of His people. And so when we don't have the answers, and we don't have the strength or the ability even to think about what we would do, I love how it frees me and it frees us all when we say, when we hear, The Lord is the strength of His people. The Lord is the strength of his people. And so that's the reason I, I really kind of dove into this psalm when, when Sam mentioned that this was something that we were going to be doing, and it's something that I really want to talk about with you guys today as we head into this chat, to, to this message. And it really isn't a, a, a real message per se. I kind of want to look at it as a devotional. I'm just sharing with you guys the thoughts that kind of came into my heart, and that's basically it. Um, before we read Psalm 28, I just want to set up the context, and that will help you understand a little bit better as to what these words mean. This psalm is written by David. We all know David. Um, he's the second king of Israel. Um, we, we, all throughout the, the Old Testament, there are various stories about David. This specific moment, although we don't know for certain where, what the context is, many believe that it's in the context of him running away from King Saul. So David has been anointed king by Samuel, but before he has taken office, and while King Saul is still king, he is on a murderous rampage trying to destroy David before he can become king. And so David is running from city to city, uh, just hiding out in different places to avoid being killed by Saul. And so this psalm is written in that context where he's running, he's trying to avoid death, where death is really looming, at, really impending upon his life, where he is just looking at each and every day just for him to survive is a miracle. I mean, he, he is literally within moments of being killed by Saul and his people. And this is the context that we find these words of David, these, these words that kind of that, that kind of show us the emotions that he's feeling, but also the determination that he has to stay dependent on God. So as you read these verses with me, please keep what David is going through at the front of your mind. Read with me. To you, Lord, I call. You are my rock. Do not turn a deaf ear to me. For if you remain silent, I will be like those who go down to the pit. 
Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help, as I lift up my hands toward your most holy place. Do not drag me away with the wicked, with those who do evil, who speak cordially with their neighbors but harbor malice in their hearts. Repay them for their deeds and for their evil work. Repay them for what their hands have done and bring back on them what they deserve because they have no regard for the deeds of the Lord and what his hands have done. He will tear them down and never build them up again. Praise be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and he, leap, and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy and with my song I praise him. The Lord is the strength of his people, a fortress of salvation for his anointed one. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. I want to begin by addressing the very first verse that David uses here in Psalm 28. And I love how he addresses God as his rock. He addresses God as his rock. And I don't know if you guys are, you know, been out there, you, you kind of see some of these larger rocks, and you kind of know that the stronger, the bigger, the larger a rock is, the more stable, the more, the, the more able it is to sustain any kind of force or any kind of stress that is placed upon it. And David looks upon God as his firm rock, that foundation that stabilizes him in the midst of the chaos that he is feeling and facing every single day. When he's being crowded up against, when he's being threatened, when he is facing death, when all around him is just nothing but an instability, God, David looks to God for his stability. He looks to God to be that solid rock. You know, your tendency and my tendency would be to look after our friends, maybe look to our family for some sense of support. But what happens when they're unable to help you? What happens when you're in a situation and what, maybe they don't want to help you or maybe they just can't help you? What happens when your intellect, your ability to maybe gather up your resources, your, your wisdom fails you? What happens then? I'm reminded of these, the 12 disciples. You know, there was a day when they were out on the water and, and you know, there's a massive storm that comes up. The wind and the waves are, are, are coming against that boat. And mind you, many of these disciples are trained, experienced fishermen. So they know what it's like to be in storms. They know how to handle storms. But on this particular day, they're running out of ideas. All of their training, all of their experience is failing them because no matter what they try to do, they are unable to stabilize their situation. Their boat is about to turn over. They're about to die. And it's within these last moments that they turn to Jesus and they say to him or they ask him, don't you care that we're about to die? You're here sleeping, but don't you care that we're about to die. Jesus rises up. He speaks over the winds and over the waves, and he says, peace, be still. And within a moment, the waves and the wind calm down. But what I found interesting is a question that Jesus asks the disciples after all this takes place. Do you still not believe? Do you still not believe. You have no faith. It's a profound question because like the disciples, don't we exhaust all of our resources, exhaust all of our friends, exhaust all of our time, our money, our energy trying to solve a problem and then we reach for Jesus at the very end when we have nothing left to go after. Isn't it interesting that we only come to Jesus when we really have no other way out, when we don't have enough money or wisdom to solve our problem. I love how David approaches this psalm beginning with this acknowledgement that God, you're my rock. It's not my friends. 
It's not my resources. It's not my money. But you are the rock that stabilizes my chaos. You are the rock that provides me perspective on how to view this situation. God, oh Lord, you are my rock. And I want to begin by just telling you this. Before you reach for your money, before you reach for that phone to call your friend, or before you try to figure out how you're going to solve this next problem, I plead with you that you would begin your situation by approaching your solid rock, your solid rock in God. Because I, I want you to know that it's his presence that will stabilize your chaos. It's his presence that will bring you perspective in the trial that you're going through. And honestly, it's his strength that will flourish so much stronger in our times of weakness. This morning, I just want to share with you four pleas or four petitions that David makes in this psalm. And I'm just going to briefly touch on them. Don't be overwhelmed when I say four. It's not going to be a very long, long message, okay? So just four pleas, but it'll be very brief and short, all right? So don't tune me out just yet. I'll tell you when not to, okay? Um, but anyway, the first plea or the first petition that David makes is this, hear me. If you're taking notes, that's simply it. Hear me, two words. And it's in verses one and two. David begins by acknowledging God as his rock, but then he implores or he pleads with God to hear me, God. Hear me. Now, it's not that David believes that God has developed a sense of deafness or that he's ignorant of the problems that he's going through, but it really begins to help us understand that the situation or the problems that David is going through, he's beginning to pour out and, and begin to expose the fact that he is in a desperate place. And he pleads with God, hear my cry for mercy. I'm not just asking you for something small, but I need mercy. I'm desperate, God. I'm broken. I'm in a very broken and dire place. I need you, God. And he's just beginning to ask God. He's beginning to seek for God to hear him. Although, again, like I said, we're not completely sure of his circumstances, we do know that David is in some desperate trouble. And I find it interesting that it begins by pleading this way, hear me. It's when we're, isn't it true for all of us, that it's when we're at the climax of our pain, when we're at the climax of our struggle, when we're at the climax of our trial, that God seems the most silent, that God seems the most distant. From your own experience, isn't it true that when you're at the climax of your struggle, that you feel as if God is the most furthest he could ever be? It seems as if he's ignorant. It seems as if he's deaf to our, our pain. And all that we hear is the struggle that we're in. All that we can feel is the loneliness and the pain that we feel from the struggle that we're in. It speaks louder and louder, and we feel lonelier and lonelier. See, I don't think it's that God has become ignorant or deaf to us, but I think it's that we've become ignorant and deaf towards Him. I want to say that again. In the midst of our struggle, in the midst of our trial, it's not that, we, it's not that God has been ignorant and deaf towards us, but it's that we begin to hear the struggle so much louder that we've become ignorant and deaf towards God. God is present and active in every moment of our lives. Although he may seem quiet or he may seem far off, God is still very present, he's very aware, and he's very active. Like the disciples scurrying around the boat, they are frantically looking to find a way to break down, the, the, try to, to manage to withstand the storms of their life when all they needed to do was turn to Jesus, who was simply in the boat. Did you know that one of Jesus' greatest miracles was raising Lazarus from the dead? Did you know that in John 11, verse 6, it says that Jesus waited two additional days where he was at before he turned or went to Lazarus, who he knew was sick? He waited two more days after finding out Lazarus was sick. It makes no sense. If Jesus had happened to go for earlier, if he had went right away, he might have had a chance to touch Lazarus before he ever died. But Jesus had a plan. And he knew that this was for the greater glory of God. 
that he could show them that even though Lazarus died, he, being Jesus, being the Son of God, had the power to raise the dead to life. And ultimately, he displayed for all that he has the power and the ability to take life's worst situation and resurrect it to life because he waited those two days. See, Jesus was very aware, he was very active, but he had a plan. And the same things that we go through this morning, I just want you to know that as we plead with God to hear us, we need to understand that he is there, he's hearing you. But it's up to us to begin to listen and begin to acknowledge him versus acknowledging the pain and the struggle that we're in so much. One other observation I want to pull out is, is this, in the first two verses, is, is David speaks to God from his heart. He, he really lets down his walls. He, he, he's becoming transparent. He's becoming real with God, painfully honest. For most of us, to become this transparent, to become this open and vulnerable, is very difficult. For most of us, we would much rather conceal our flaws or conceal our brokenness and hide it behind a smile or hide it behind activity, we really don't feel comfortable leaving ourselves open and bare before anyone. But David's word teaches us that we are to open ourselves, express our true emotions before God, our brokenness before God. And I will tell you this, and you guys have already known this in your own lives, but the more you try to conceal the brokenness and the junk in your life, it's, it's like a ticking time bomb. It's eventually going to come out. And oftentimes it comes, comes out in an explosive way. Right? You have no control of how it comes out. It just kind of explodes. And unfortunately, it's usually our loved ones, the, closest, the people closest to us that are caught by our, our mess. That explosive throwing up of, whatever it is we're trying to conceal. So I encourage you, open yourselves up to the Lord. Open yourselves up and allow him to, to, to deal with you, to work with you on the struggle that you're going through, no matter how broken you seem to be. Open yourselves up. And I love this in verse 2, um, how it says that as David began to pour himself out to God, he lifts his, his hand up towards the holy temple, towards God's holy place, which really means to us that the more we allow God to enter into our mess, the more we allow him to take a look at what's going on inside of us, the more we understand how much we need God. And we offer up our hands and surrender and say, look, God, I need you. I'm offering up my hands. I'm doing this because I need your help. I see how desperate of a place I'm in. I've tried to hide it for so long. I'm wrong, God. I, I surrender to you. I realize just how badly I need you. Plea number one, hear me. Plea number two is found in verses three to five. Repay the wicked. Repay the wicked. It's in these verses that we begin to have some understanding as to what David is going through. You know, the, the malice that people are harboring in their hearts and how it's affecting him and and it's beginning to show us what struggles David is going through in these verses. But I find it interesting that rather than take matters into his own hands, which is what I would like to do, maybe which is what you would like to do, you know, become impulsive and retaliate, David leaves it to the Lord. He depends on God to fight that battle. And the reason he does it is found in verse 5 because they have no regard for the deeds of the Lord and, is what, and what his hands have done. David understands that this battle isn't against him per se, but this battle is against God and God's plan, God's work. David somehow develops this God-centered perspective. He's not looking at himself or what's going on with him so much, but he's beginning to develop this understanding of, look, this plan, this thing is much bigger than me. It's, it's God. It's his plan. 
And it's up to God to find a way to provide a deliverance, to provide an answer, to provide a relief. You know, maintaining a God-centered perspective in this culture in the West is really, really hard. When this culture in the West, with the advances of technology and comfort, I mean, they cater to your every single need so that whatever you want is really there at the, at the press of a button. Whatever you want. And, and essentially, the message it conveys to us is that it's all about you. Your iPad's not fast enough? Well, we can take care of that. Your computer's not fast enough? Your phone's not fast enough? Well, you know, how disappointed I was that I bought, like, the S3, and then just months later, another S, like the S4 comes out. You know, everything moves so fast. Everything's being done so fast so that they can cater to your every whim. It's all about you, the consumer. You know, I, I just want to caution you guys, and I, want, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but it isn't all about you. Right? It's not about you. It's not about me. We exist because of God. He is the reason we exist. Therefore, we exist for God. We exist because of God. Therefore, we exist for God. Do not buy into this lie that tells you that you have to be about yourself. You're about yourself. It's all about you. Disconnect yourself from that and understand that you exist for God and His purpose alone. And the trials that you face in life are not limited to your personal circumstances. The trials you face in life are really an attack against the reputation of God, you, the God you serve, as well as the faith you place in God. That's where the trial really comes in, is how is this affecting my faith in the God that I love and serve? Our tendencies are to react impulsively, retaliate, find ways to remedy our circumstance. But how is that really affecting your faith in God? Is it hurting it or is it really helping it? I just want to say this thing about this and then we'll move on. David rightfully understands that this is a fight that is meant to be fought by the Lord. Right? David was a man who would fight. Right? We understand that if you read through his life, he knew which fights to, to, to battle in and he knew which to leave completely to God. In the same manner, during the course of your life, there are going to be moments in the trials that you face that you cannot do a thing. You are powerless. You are unable to think of an answer. You're unable to, to really do an answer. There's going to be moments in the trials that you go through that it's best that you don't do a thing. It's best that you actually wait. Wait on the Lord. Wait on what He's trying to do. It's best that you don't impulsively act or do something you're going to regret later. It's best that you wait. It's best that you wait and let, let God accomplish his plan and his purpose. And unfortunately, I, and I feel like it's unfortunate for me to say this, but there are going to be times in your life when you're in the midst of a trial that you may suffer. You may suffer. And there may be times where someone you know or yourself, it, it may result in death. You know, God allows these things, but there's ultimately a purpose behind it that is far greater than our suffering or our death. Even the, 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 the early church, you know, they maintained a God-centered perspective. They, they maintained a perspective that their faith in Christ was what was more important. And although they were persecuted, they were being beaten and tormented, they didn't raise a fist against those aggressors. But it although they could have, although they could have retaliated, although they could have done something to, to, to ex, you know, exact pain on the people offending them, they chose to defend their faith more. For them, God and, his, and their faith in God was much more important, much more valuable. And even today, the backbone of our church is because of their willingness to suffer and even die for the faith. The fact that we're sitting here in a pew worshiping God is really because of the blood and the sweat that they shed as the backbone of the church. So there will be times where we would have to wait and allow God to exact justice. Plea number two, repay the wicked. Plea number three, it's found in verses six, seven, and eight. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, 
I don't see this as a plea that David is making to God. Rather, I think of it as a plea that David is making to himself. Uh, you know, notice, I believe it's in verse 6 that, you know, we read verse 1 or 2 where David is pleading for God to hear him. Within a matter of four or five verses, David says that God has heard him. God has heard him. And as we go through this psalm, we're beginning to understand that David, as he pens these words about God and about justice and about his dependence on God, he is beginning to develop a sense of courage and boldness himself. And he's beginning to praise God. Please understand, nothing about his circumstance has changed. Saul is still coming after him. Death is around the corner. Nothing has changed but David. David begins to develop this sense of courage, boldness, to the point where he is now praising God, worshiping God. In verse 7, it says that his heart is trusting in God. God is his strength and shield. And I want to just touch on verse 8. The Lord is the strength of his people, a fortress of salvation for his anointed one. His anointed one. David is the anointed one. Moments before, or, or days ago, Samuel has anointed David as the next king of Israel. Samuel has anointed David to replace King Saul. So David understands that. David, David knows that he was not meant, you know, his upbringing was to become a shepherd. He was shepherding his father's flock at the time. He wasn't expecting or aspiring to be a king, but he knows that because God worked through Samuel, anointed him as the king of Israel. And because of that position that he had before God, he knew God was going to provide him salvation. He knew that God would not allow his anointed to falter and be defeated, but he knew God would provide him salvation, as it says there in verse 8. My friends, let me just remind you that you are anointed, you're called by God through his son, Jesus Christ. His son that, he, that shed his blood, that died on a cross, so that you could be called the sons and daughters of God. That's the position that you and I have, is that we who trust in Jesus are now sons and daughters of God. I want you to know, that we can praise God freely in the midst of trials, in the midst of our circumstances because of that position. We will never be defeated. We will never fall in defeat because we have that position of, of being called the sons and daughters of God. And that is a blessed position that we have been given through Jesus. So we take courage in the midst of trials. And the tendency for us is that we, be in, we tend to magnify our tri trial. We, may, we tend to look at the position of, of, of the struggle that we're in, and we forget who we are. We forget the bigger picture, which is that we are God's. We are his children. and He will never abandon us. He will never allow us to fall in defeat. A couple of questions I want to ask you regarding that is, um, do you see the bigger picture of God's plan over your life when you're experiencing a struggle or a trial? Or are you limited in your view to feeling defeated and victimized by your trial? What are unique, simple ways you can praise God even before he responds to you? The last plea, plea number four, save your people. It's in verse 9, chapter 28. Save your people. It says, save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. David understood God's heart for his people, the nation of Israel. David understood that the reason God called him as king was to replace Saul. That, David was, that God was concerned about his people and the condition that they were in. And I find it amazing that David not only is going to become king, but he embraces God's concern for Israel. And he pleads with God, save your people. 
you know, it began with him crying out for mercy for himself, but it ends with this perspective of saying, look, it's not about my current situation. The bigger picture is save your people. Save your people. When we, we talk a lot about what is God's plan for my life, and we limit it to a major, to a career, to the person you marry, what is God's plan for my life? I just want you to know, you know, it's not rocket science. Before you even pick that major, I can tell you what God's plan for your life is. Before you marry that person, before you pick your career, I can tell you right now what God's plan for your life is. Just make that check out to me, 50 bucks per person, and I will tell you what God's plan, you know what God's, actually I should increase the rate on that. Let's make it to 1,000 bucks. I'm feeling good today. 1,000 bucks, and I'll give you the answer to that question. But seriously, there is only one purpose for which we are existing on this planet. There's only one plan that God has for us as we live on this planet. The reason you and I are now breathing on this earth is so that we would spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost. That's God's plan for your life. That's God's plan for my life. It's not so much that, you know, these are all things that are well and good. It's not so much that you make lots of money and place in your bank account or your kids go to private school or you find a home out in Hawaii and you, you, that's your retirement home. I mean, all of that is nice but that still falls way short of the reason you're breathing this morning. The reason you're alive today is so that you would spread the good news of Jesus to those around you. That is why you're alive. That is why you're here, is that you would spread the life-saving message of Jesus to the earth. See, David gets that the whole big picture of this is that God would save his people, that God would rescue his people. And in the same manner, we who are in the midst of our struggle or in the midst of our trial, that plan has not changed. That plan has not faltered. For all of us who are in the midst of any struggle or trial, no matter what it is, if it's a disease, if it's some sort of financial distress, the plan of God over our lives has not faltered. The plan of God is that we would continue to share the gospel with the lost, in hopes that someone or many would come to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And I understand that this makes absolutely no sense for people who are struggling with an illness such as cancer. You know, it's in these moments that we want to make it about ourselves, when we deserve to make it about ourselves. I mean, we've done so much for people. We are here dying in our bed. Why would we want to do that? It makes no sense. And I struggle with even being, even saying that to you this morning, but yet I, I, I got to go with what the scriptures say, which is save your people. In every, in every, any opportunity that we are given, we are to share the good news of Jesus, even in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our fiercest trial. Jesus Christ demonstrates this for us. And in a few moments, I'll be stepping off this stage and you'll be taking part of the communion. You'll be holding a piece of bread. You'll be holding a little bit of juice. And as you reflect in that moment over what Jesus has done for you on the cross, I want you to remember a moment on the cross that exemplifies what it means to save someone in the midst of suffering. I want you to remember the torment that Jesus went through leading up to the cross, the, the scourging, the mockery, being spit at in the face, being mocked and, and, and just essentially tormented both physically and emotionally. I want you to reflect on the fact that Jesus was, very, was so alone that even his own father had to turn his back upon him. I want you to reflect upon the fact that Jesus is now hanging off a cross. And with every movement with every breath that he has to breathe in and breathe out comes excruciating pain. I want you to remember this specific moment as you hold that cup and as you take of that bread. I want you to remember this conversation that he has with one of the thieves. 
And if you remember with me, one of the thieves pleads with Jesus, a request of Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. Remember me when you enter your kingdom. And in that brief moment before Jesus provides an answer, let me just throw these thoughts in there. Where was this man when Jesus spent 33 years of his life out there on the, on the earth teaching and healing and doing all sorts of things? Where was this man when he had every opportunity to reach for Jesus when he was out there amongst the people? That's right. This man was engaging in all sorts of sin, all sorts of evil, and all sorts of wickedness, so badly that he had to die on a cross himself for what he did. You know, it's in this moment that Jesus could have done many things. He could have said different things. He could have said, look, you had your chance. You had your chance to come to me when I was there. You didn't do that. Instead, you engaged in evil and sin and wickedness. And it's in this moment that Jesus could have said, look, I'm hurting right now. My father has abandoned me. I can barely breathe. I'm done. I'm spent. I'm ready to say it is finished because I've got nothing left. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus looks over gently to that man just as he would have done as he had been on the earth with any child or any adult, he says to him, yes, surely you will be with me. Surely today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus rescued the souls of men at the climax of his suffering on earth. Jesus rescued the souls of men when he suffered the most, when his father abandoned him, when all of mankind crucified him with sweat of blood pouring down his skull and pain going through every part of his body where his breathing was so painful and took so much effort. Jesus rescued the souls of men. And so I want to encourage you this morning to think about this in the context of your struggle, in the context of your trial. Will you be faithful to share the gospel, to, to, to live out the gospel, to preach the gospel, even when you are suffering? Even when there is no end in sight to the pain that you're going through, whether it be physically or mentally or emotionally, whatever, if you don't have a single answer, will you still share his gospel and follow the path that Jesus set for us? As I'm about to walk off this stage, I just want to wrap up this psalm once more, Psalm 28. I love a lot of things about it, and I don't know what you guys picked up here and there. Um, the transformation of David as he's even writing the psalm from pleading with God to hear him and at the end he pleads with God to save his people. You, you kind of notice just how he becomes more bolder, more courageous in his faith. His willingness to wait on God to fight his battles when he could have maybe handled it differently. I'll just be honest with you. As I, as I walk off this stage, if you don't remember a single thing I said, please remember this. I plead with you, and I plead to myself when I say this, is that take advantage of any, any and every opportunity to share Jesus to the people around you. Forget everything else. Just do that. Even in the context of your suffering and your trial, just as Jesus did on the cross, please share Christ with everything you got in you, with every opportunity that you got, because it is the reason you and I are breathing right now. Let me pray for us. Father, 
so grateful for your word. I'm so grateful for the perspective your word brings to us. And God, I'm so thankful for these words that just give us perspective um, towards trials and, and suffering that we go through in this life. Although it doesn't bring us the ultimate answer to what we're going through, it provides us perspective. And I pray that the singular perspective that we take away from this is that we would do everything we can, God, to share your love, uh, share Jesus in, every, in any and every circumstance, Father. And God, I remember all of us who are in the midst of various trials that we're going through. I pray, Father, that you would reach to them through your word this morning, that if it's that they just need to be assured that you're hearing them, if it's that they need to, to be aware of the fact that you are working and that they just simply need to listen to you and wait, or if it's that you just want them to open their eyes to how and who they can share Jesus to, I just pray that in these scriptures he would somehow reach each of us and help us to make a move. Father, we acknowledge that we're here because of you and because we are supposed to share Jesus to those around us. So we ask that you help us to do that. Bless us as we're about to take communion this morning. We love you. We thank you for Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name.